and uh, can I welcome you to this meeting of the Planning Applications Board for Thursday the 9th of May 2024. Can I remind you that the meeting has been recorded and the recording will be made available on the CONA's website following the meeting. Item number one on today's agenda is the minute of the meeting of the 6th of December 2023 and that's for your approval. Happy with that? Thank you. Item number two is declaration of interest. Members are asked to declare any interest that they may have in any items on the agenda. It would be helpful if members explained why they are declaring an interest in the item concerned. Any declarations of interest? Well, for the board's information, I will, will be declaring an, in, an interest at item four, as I am the corner's representative on Urus Natoshigan and prior to that item, I shall vacate the chair and defer to the vice chair who will lead the board through its deliberations on that item. Uh, in relation to board procedures, any motion or amendment in relation to a planning application must be based solely on planning reasons. If a member moves an amendment, the chair will invite him or her to clearly articulate the amendment and the planning reasons upon which it is based. Thereafter, the chair may at his discretion continue the business of the meeting in accordance with the timeout protocol. A copy of the timeout protocol has been made available to all members via the planning board folder on SharePoint. The planning manager for the development team will present the recommendation of officers. In the event of a member seeking to move an amendment, the board may call upon the legal advisor or planning advisor to provide advice to the board. Item number three on today's agenda is an application to demolish existing ruins and erect three chalets, utility shed, parking and drainage at Gary Gowl, Isle of Barra. This application has received more than six valid representations that raise material planning considerations and is therefore presented to the board for a decision. And can I invite Mrs Ferguson to speak to the report? Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this report relates to planning application for the siting of three chalet units, which are designed to meet the definition of a caravan in planning terms. Uh, they are for use for short term let tourist accommodation, and the development will include a utility shed, an access road, and parking provision for each of the units, a seating area with footpaths connecting. Yes. Um, just a moment, Mrs. Ferguson. Can I can I confirm to members online? Can you hear the presentation okay? I can hear it fine. Uh, Councillor McNeil. Councillor McNeil, can you hear us here in the chamber? I wonder, Councillor McNeil, could you correspond with uh, our clerk, Fiona, as to what issues you're having online? OK, members, we shall just uh, adjourn the meeting for 10 minutes until we uh, rectify Councillor McNeill's uh, contact with the Chamber. Thank you.
Hello. Can you hear us clearly, Tam? Sorry, I still can't hear you. Spencer McNeil, can you hear us in the chamber here? Tam, can you hear us? Paul Finnegan, can you hear us here in the chamber? Susan, can you hear us? Loud and clear. Okay. Hi. 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 I can I can hear you. Now I've, I've 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 come in on my mobile, on, on the mobile rather than on the laptop. So Great. I can hear you. I can hear you now. Grand. Okay. okay. Paul, can you hear me? Just go. Very good. Thank you for that. Technical difficulties have now been averted. Um, we shall return to item three in the agenda, which was to demolish existing ruins and erect three chalets, utility shed, parking and drainage at Gary Gill, Isle of Barra. This application has received more than six valid representations that raised material planning considerations and is therefore presented to the board for a decision. And can I now invite Morag Ferguson to speak to the report? OK, thank you, Chair. I'll just go back and start again. So this report relates to, the, to an application for the siting of three chalet units, which are designed to meet the definition of a caravan in planning terms. These are to be used for short term led tourist accommodation and they will include a utility shed, an access road and parking provision, a seating area and footpaths connecting the area to the individual shallow units. Um, is also uh, to be provided within the site. Uh, then storage will be included close to the um, entrance to the site. So in policy terms, the site is within a rural settlement uh, location in relation to the spatial strategy of the Outer Hebrides Development Plan. The site is set back a short distance from the Breivik Township Road and it's located to the north of an existing dwelling. The site's not within crofting tenure and it's separated from the neighbouring dwelling by a strip of land that forms an access to an area of common grazing beyond. To the south of the site, there's a small group of dwellings which are accessed off and clustered around the end of the public road. The site is set back a short distance from the coast, which lies to the east. The application site itself extends to 0.2 of a hectare, 2,000 square metres. Um, the site is classified as dispersed crofting in Nature Scots Landscape Character Assessment and is out with any area that's been designated for environmental uh, reasons. It's also out with any area that's been uh, identified as being at risk under the SEPA flood maps, which are the screening tool which we use uh, for assessment of development that may be at risk of flooding. Further, the application is not within any area defined as a sensitive area and therefore given the site area is less than one hectare uh, threshold specified within the regulations, it's not necessary to screen the development uh, under the environmental impact assessment regulations. The map on the screen just uh, um, identifies the ring road round uh, Barra. Castle Bay is to the very south, the bay at the south and Breivik, uh, the site is identified in red on the screen. Uh, this site, um, this part of uh, Garikal is actually accessed via Breivik Township. This is just an aerial view and it lets you see the, this is the part of the um, circle road round Barra. Uh, Garikal Township is just off the screen to the left the kind of houses that are slightly higher up Garigal, just creeping into the image there. 
uh, the former uh, quarry at Garigal, you can see um, there. And then as you go over the hill um, down the other side of Belach Breivik, the access comes into Breivik village itself on the top right of the slide. And yeah. this group of houses uh, to the bottom right hand of the screen are actually within Garigal township, albeit accessed through Breivik. <laughs> This is just a slightly more detailed uh, image of that, so you can see the um, site, the access into the village is the top right, uh, just off centre, um, and the application site is in the bottom quadrant of the screen, just beside uh, the river. You can see just uh, which runs into the sea there. This is just a map of the location. It's not terribly clear on the screen. I'll maybe just skip over that and take you to the aerial image again. So this group of dwellings um, south of the river here are within Garigal Township and the application site is the area that is identified um, just south of the river where you can see the footprint of some former ruined, probably like thatched buildings. Um, the nearest neighbouring house is that, again, in the top um, left quadrant of the screen. Um, so the house there is the uh, is the nearest neighbour to the dwelling. You can see like a bright white area there, and that is the start of an of the access track into the site. So this is the site plan of the proposed development. You can see the house number 37 in the lower quadrant of the screen. And if you, uh, as you enter the site, the first um, building on the light left is the utility building, which would include the proposed power supply for the development. There will be an access track which would wind its way through the site, which rises from the road as you move back through the site. <coughs> And you can see the three rectangles there, darker rectangles, are the siting of the proposed Charlie buildings, uh, which are assessed as caravans. And then there is parking and turning for each uh, within the site. On the top right, um, there is a note that indicates a septic tank, an existing septic tank, which is just on the shores of the um, stream there, Old Alistair. And in the bottom right, you will see like another note where there is a, a proposed alternative position for that septic tank. I'll come to talk about that again later in the report. So this is just the kind of aerial image again, just to kind of just give a bit more context to that. So in terms of the footprints of the ruin, the first chalet would be sited at the almost with the front garden of the house, so it would be where that furthest forward ruin is. So the position of that, uh, the front of the chalet would be um, set there. Okay, so as I've said um, at the start, the application seeks permission for the siting of these three chalet units. Uh, and the proposal is to use them for short term let tourist accommodation. Um, the seating area and footpaths would connect each of the individual chalets with a bin store at the front of the entrance to the site. In terms of dimension, the chalet units would be uh, nine metres by four metres in footprint. Uh, they would have monopitch roof and would have a maximum height of 3.7 metres. Mm -hmm. um, they would be clad in vertical timber, stained or painted grey with a metal profile roof. And there is a proposal to have some photovoltaic solar arrays um, within the roof area to generate uh, power. And in addition to that, a 12 person sewage treatment plant is proposed to serve the development. The existing septic tank serving the adjacent dwellings located towards the north boundary. And while that's capable of retention on the basis of the proposed layout, the developer has also allowed for the option of providing a new septic tank and soak away to serve the neighbouring property as an alternative to the existing provision. 
These are just some images of the uh, elevations of the propulse chalets. A cross section just indicating the overall dimensions, so four meters. Uh, screen's just gone off. Okay, so um, just illustrating the internal height there at 2.8 meters within uh, the required dimensions for a caravan and externally 3.7. Uh, meters. Our well, plan is fairly standard for these uh, uh, caravan type structures, which are um, akin to a small static caravan. At the time of drafting this report, there were 24, 22 individuals, and the Community Council had submitted comments, all of which objected to the proposal. One further comment was received earlier this week. The objection had uh, already submitted, had already contributed to the comments, and the representation did not raise new issues that have not already been addressed in the assessment. The main issues raised by uh, through representations are summarised in paragraph 10.4 of the report, and I've just set them out briefly on the slideshow for ease of reference. So I'll just let members read through these, but the representations are in relation to the appearance and character of the development, the scale of the development, loss of ruins, impact on croft land and access to crofts, alternatives, need, issues to do the septic tank, issues to do with the proximity to the water course, feasibility of sewage infrastructure and then impact on protected species. And then the next uh, slide is a continuation, so impacts on habitats, biodiversity, likely lifespan of these structures, concerns about living conditions and impact on neighbour amenity, including privacy. Impact on road safety, the condition of the bridge, the local road network and construction impacts more generally. Concerns about noise, disturbance, pollution, light spillage. Concerns over potential management of the site, how this uh, sustainability of the development risks of antisocial behaviour and crime um, arising from the intended use, flood risk and um, a risk to potential development of adjacent sites. These are views, uh, this is a view taken from the main Barra Circular Road, the A888, looking uh, down towards uh, this cluster of ha uh, houses uh, in Karakal Township albeit accessed from Breivik. There's a view taken at the entrance to the site, um, and you can see there the photographs of the ruins which would be demolished. Just to the left, you'll see the post on the, le the left hand post of the gate, and you'll see like a narrow fenced corridor between the application site and the neighbouring dwelling. And that is the means of access to uh, the common grazing area that's beyond. There's just a further view from the site entrance, and to the left you can see the access serving the adjoining um, dwelling house and the frontage of the dwelling house there. It's just another further view of the site from the entrance, again just showing the remains of the ruined of the former buildings in the foreground there. And this is just a view looking towards the main Barra Road, uh, the circle <coughs> where you can see the houses beyond. They're now like just a series of images just panning around the site. So this is a view taken from the track that would ac provide access to the common grazings. Um, 
across towards the rest of the village of Breivik and across the bay. This is just a view uh, panning round to the neighbouring property from the site, and that house does not have any windows on that gable that's facing the site. Also, just uh, to note that the house, the neighbouring house, sits at a slightly higher level than the application site. It's another view looking uh, east and taken sort of further back on the site, and there again you can see the remain the remains of the two of the. Uh, ruined structures and the uh, former that chimneys of the former th and wall of the former thatched building just um, in the centre of the picture. And this is just another view looking south towards the gable wall of the neighbouring house with one of the ruins in the foreground. And then this view is looking along the northern boundary of the site, so there's another uh, structure there that would be demolished and you can see the river just uh, or the stream just on the left hand side there uh, which discharges takes water from the hill uh, beyond and discharges into the sea. Just pause for a moment till this PowerPoint comes back. The development set the uh, report sets out the assessment uh, in relation to the development plan, which is comprised of the Outer Hebrides Local Development Plan and National Planning Framework 4. The report concludes with the recent conclusion, uh, which I've set out for ease of reference on the screen. So uh, in accordance with uh, NPF 4, the development would make a positive contri contribution towards the provision of tourist and holiday accommodation. It's our assessment that it would not unacceptably detract from the wider landscape character of the local area or have adverse impacts on neighbouring amenity. Subject to controls uh, exercised via condition of external lighting, and restrictions to limit the life of the permission to 10 years, which is standard for uh, a caravan uh, site, uh, and limit the use of these buildings to the design that's been specified. It's considered that the longer term visual impacts of the proposal would remain acceptable. The protection of otters, if indeed they are present, is likely to be such that impacts can be secured through the use of appropriate mitigation measures. Uh, as identified in to be identified in an otter survey, which is still awaited at the time of writing the report. Details of the surface water drainage for the site can also be secured uh, to prevent surface water flooding. And um, we are seeking approval of the hard landscaping details for the site, including um, the roots of the pathways, um, they are set out in such a way that they should, uh, they're 10 metres from the water course. They're also at a higher level and that would protect the water course. Further adequate space can be provided within the site for the parking and turning of vehicles and the existing means of access is considered appropriate in terms of um, road safety and particular visibility. As a result, overall, it's concluded that the development would be acceptable and for the reasons set out above would result in some economic and social benefits to the area with the identified potential environmental impacts capable of satisfactory mitigation. Proposed development is therefore uh, considered subject to condition to accord with the National Planning Framework 4 and the Outer Hebrides Local Development Plan when taken as a whole, um, and also with a supplementary guidance on caravans, huts and temporary buildings. We've not identified uh, material considerations, including those recent representation, that would justify a decision uh, to be taken in accordance, other than in accordance with the development plan. The recommendation, therefore, is that if following the outcome of a survey, uh, on otter, which is a European protected species which is still awaited, any potential adverse impacts on otters can be mitigated by condition. 
the plan that the planning application be approved subject to the conditions set out in Appendix 1 with any other auto mitigation condition that is deemed necessary. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, Mrs Ferguson, for that very extensive report. I would now like to open this out to members of the board for any questions or comments. Councillor Macaulay. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Maura, for that comprehensive report. Um, just something you said at the very beginning, I was just out of curiosity more than anything else. I think you said that the chalet had been designed to fit caravan planning reasons. Is that just a matter of its, the size of it, or is there more, more to it than that? Just, just thank you. Uh, yes, there is a definition of a caravan set out in the Caravan Sites uh, 1960 Act. It's been amended a couple of times to bring it up to date, but um, and there are various legal tests that are required to be satisfied. But basically, it must be movable on a tra on a trailer. It doesn't necessarily need to be movable on its own wheels, and it cannot exceed certain dimensions. Um, there's also like a construction test. Um, so basically, once assembled, it must be capable of being moved, not necessarily on the public road, but sufficient to be able to move it. So they tend to have like a substructure, uh, you know, a frame or lifting point. So Macaulay. Thanks. So potentially in a year's time, they could lift it up and take it away and put it somewhere else. It could subject to planning, subject to any requirement for planning permission. That would be it. Thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. You mentioned uh, an auto survey. How long do you envisage having to wait for that? Or did it delay things dramatically? It shouldn't delay things dramatically. We did chase it up again yesterday and the uh, applicant is trying, has been in contact with a number of ecologists to try and find somebody who would be able to go to Barra to carry out that survey. They're not able to confirm us yet, but I would think it would be, you know, within the next number of weeks we should have access to that survey. Once we receive it, we will consult Nature Scott on it again. But typically, unless there are otters uh, resting or breeding on the site, it would, in which case a, a, a license would be required. The presence of otters can usually be mitigated through a species protection plan that just requires certain um, checks and balances during cons during uh, construction works. Thank you. If they do find otter, otters there, will that stop the thing going ahead? Because I know there are otters there, I've seen them, <laughs> and they haven't been affected by all the other houses that are there, so. But they're quite nosy, yeah, they come right up to the shore. And... Um, each case is just decided on its own merits, so there are different uh, there is kind of resting and breeding, in which case a species license would be required. Um, so there's a there's another consenting process that would be required. But if they are just transiting the site, then a mitigation plan, uh, which would be secured by condition, would be the appropriate way to go. So it doesn't. It would be unusual for it to wholly prevent development. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Uh, Mrs. Ferguson, regarding the grazing access corridor, is the is there a proposal for that corridor to be widened or be maintained at its current width? And could I bring you in there? I seem to recall that there was a proposal that they would they were looking to widen it slightly. Just slightly, yes, to uh, maintain a four meter width access through to the grazing, common grazings beyond um, the site, yes. Okay, thank you, Anne. Any other comments or questions from members of the board in the chamber or online? Therefore, do members agree with the recommendations at 3.1 and that planning be approved? Thank you. In advance of the next item, I shall now vacate the chair and hand over to the vice chair who will continue proceedings.
Okay. Ronald has left the building, so we can carry on item four. Uh, this is a, an application for alterations to an extension of the Kalanish Visitor Center. Uh, this ap application has been considered to be sensitive by the appointing officer and is therefore in accordance with the scheme of delegations referred to the board for a decision. Morak Ferguson will speak to the report and answer any questions. Thank you, Morak. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, as the Chair has said, this is an application to extend the existing Callanish uh, Visitor Centre. Uh, the proposal is to um, provide an upgraded cafe and shop and exhibition area to add a function suite, which would be a new extension to the building uh, towards the south of the site. Also, a standalone plant room, bin store, um, and public convenience buildings all on the site of the existing College Visitor Centre on the west side of Lewis. In terms of settlement strategy, uh, the application site is within the rural settlement of Callanish. Um, the development in its entirety is contained within the existing land that is uh, under the control of Urus Nudursukhan. The site itself is slightly elevated above the road. Um, the road sits to the south along the coast, but in terms of its uh, the positioning of the existing centre, it sits low in the landscape in relation to the main Callanish standing stones, which are to the north of the site. Uh, just for those maybe less familiar, um, Callanish on uh, Loch Rogue to the west side of Lewis. So this is an aerial view and an, uh, outlined in red is the extent of the application site. And in the yellow ellipse there is the site of the main Callanish standing stones, Callanish 1. That's a PowerPoint back. Uh, and here you can see like the coast road and there's a small peninsula um, to the right of the screen. And I'll just come that will uh, come through in later slides. So this is a kind of um, plan, location plan, and you can see again outlined in red the extent of the application site. The kind of dark area just to the north of that is like a raised mound which provides natural screening between the site of the centre and the Callanish, uh, main Callanish standing stone site, which is um, just to the north uh, of that dark area. The slide also shows you the extent of the coast road. So this is a um, road, this road is a um, dead end. It is, there's a small section of two way leading up to the entrance to the visitor centre and beyond that it goes into single storey to the turning head at the end of the road, just at the head of the peninsula. So the intention is to uh, alter the existing building and also to extend it. Um, and it will incorporate what was the former farmhouse uh, building which sits in front of the existing centre. Uh, there will be a new function suite extension added to the south of the centre. Uh, there's also a requirement to erect a plant room for uh, the plant that is required, including the electricity, um, to run the extended centre. Uh, there's also a proposal for a bin store and public conveniences, uh, two of which have been erected already within the grounds of the centre. The two that have been erected are under a separate planning commission granted last year. There will also be alterations to the layout and also to the level of the existing main car park. 
uh, and there will be further works carried out to a 10 bay parking area, which was again provided last year. Um, and that is in order to accommodate additional motor park, motorcycle parking from the site. So the site sits within the wider mm -hmm. cal calendar complex of which there are 14, 14 different um, sites, three of which are uh, of particular importance, and they're termed Callanish 1, 2, and 3. Again, I'll just wait for the PowerPoint to come back. So the main purpose of the centre is to accommodate visitors to the Callanish scheduled monuments, and it houses the interpretation materials for these monuments. And the application is accompanied by a supporting statement in relation to the need for the works and also in relation to the design and layout that is proposed. So this is just a useful map of the key components of the Callanish Centre. So the main standing stones are termed Callanish 1 and then on the peninsula, but what is an intervening peninsula and then on the next um, raised area of land, there are another two sites, Callanish 2 and Callanish 3, and these will come through in the photographs. One of the con main constraints associated with um, the design and development of this proposal has been the need to protect the setting of these uh, important scheduled monuments and also the relationship between these monuments. So this is the site plan. It's quite complex, um, but on the top right uh, quarter of the screen is the main access coming in from the public road. And as you enter the site, there will be on the left hand side, first of all, a bus lay a, bit, a bus uh, stopping area where buses will be able to lay over until they move towards the main drop off bus bay, which uh, is just where the point is at the moment. So to the north of that, so that bus bay will be provide level access uh, to enable people of all abilities to access the centre. Just to the north of that, there are uh, again providing level access some disabled uh, parking bays, and that whole area uh, is going to be slightly raised in order to achieve uh, the level that's required for um, all ability access. The remainder of the car park will remain pretty much as was, uh, with the additional provision of some electric vehicle charging bays, which are just identified uh, by the dark symbols there. As you uh, leave, going if you go back towards the um, main access, uh, to the north of the access, there is going to be two bays where buses can lay over after after they have dropped off. Um, their uh, signs at the centre uh, before leaving the site. Moving to the left hand side of the screen is then the actual building itself. So the um, third building is the existing stone turf slate building that was built uh, about 25 years ago uh, that houses the exhibition uh, at the moment. The area to the front is the, you can see the roof of the farmhouse, uh, the single storey extension, which is to the south and a projection to the front. These will now be integrated into the centre and the, dark, the darker areas to the east uh, are extensions. The area to the south is a new building, which will be integrated into the centre, and that's to provide a function suite for seating, which is in addition to the seating that would be in the cafe. Bottom right of uh, the screen, you'll see uh, another building, and that's uh, a recent change to the scheme, uh, and it is the provision of a plant room for the redeveloped building. Uh, that had originally been intended that it would sit below the function suite, uh, but on for both design and cost grounds, it's now a standalone uh, building and it requires to have its own access and parking bay, which again is shown on the plan. 
the design is quite complex. It's a difficult site, and one of the kind of one of the main criteria was that any extensions to the building could not exceed the height of the existing buildings in order to protect uh, the setting of the scheduled monument. The new building, so the top um, image there is of the front elevation. So it's if you were in the car park, but it's elevated to the level of the building. Um, so on the left hand side is the new building that will be an extension. You'll see in the centre like a small gable. That's the gable of the projection from the farmhouse. And to the right and left of that, there will be extensions uh, which will house uh, extended seating for the cafe. It will then be running along the front uh, monopitch corridor. It runs along the front of the main farmhouse and again will will extend the retail area and also provide the main access uh, corridor into the centre. Uh, the second image there is taken um, from within the, the courtyard, if you like. So you're looking at um, <clears throat> the back of the farmhouse and which will have a kind of large box dormer um, or a large or a sort of a building structure that will allow access to the second floor of to, or to the roof space of the uh, farmhouse via a new stair. And there it shows in cross section the new building, which would be the function suite. And then the bottom elevation is if you were at the same level as the building looking from the stones and you'd be looking onto the end. So you're looking onto the end of the existing uh, centre and the um, new buildings on the lower side to the left. Again, these images, it's not, they're not that easy to understand because the design is quite complex. But the one at the top, it's looking as if you're looking from the coast, the far end of the coast road, Again, at the level of the building, you're looking onto the new extension, uh, onto the, the end profile of it. Um, then you see to the right of that uh, top image, again, the extensions either side of the projection to the farmhouse building, which will be the extensions to the cafe. Then the next image below again is taken as, uh, from within the courtyard. Um, it's a cross section again, looking towards the back of the building, if you like. So you look standing in the courtyard, looking towards the existing uh, building that contains the exhibition and a cross section through the new building. And then the bottom image is, uh, if, you're out, if you were out in the field behind the centre, looking towards the back of the existing centre and to the right hand side of that image is the new, um, the new function suite. Now, there's an aerial, um, bird's eye aerial, which is not the most up to date, but it is useful. Uh, but before I come to that, I'll maybe just cover some of the key planning issues. So the site's in the rural settlement of Callanish and it's set below the main Callanish Stones Scheduled Monument site. The need to protect the setting of these monuments was a key constraint in undertaking the design of the development. Um, there are no consultee uh, representations outstanding and there are no third party representations to development, but a number of concerns were raised over the course of our dealing with the application. And the specific concerns were really in relation to the parking provision and layout, and particularly in relation to how buses would enter, manoeuvre and uh, leave the site. Also concerns about how pedestrians would be routed through the car park. Um, again, lots of constraints as to what the options would be because it was necessary to try and protect the historic walls and the mature trees that form part of the screening to the existing uh, centre. And the other concern expressed by Historic Environments Scotland was that the development was creeping into the less developed southern portion of the visitor centre and there is the risk of impact and views between some of the monuments uh, that form the Callanish complex of scheduled monuments. 
So it's now like a series of photographs that illustrate the views between some of the monuments of the Callanish complex. And these are taken uh, from Callanish 3, so over on the um, raised land beyond um, the main Callanish centre. So this just illustrates, so there's the photo was taken standing at the stone circle on Callanish 3. Callanish 2 sits on that same headland, but at a slightly lower level. And then Callanish 1 is on the horizon in the distance. And then the visitor centre is sitting uh, on the shore road at a lower level below that, uh, below Callanish 1. So the intervisibility between the vis uh, between these monuments is important in terms of its preservation and one of the reasons why Historic Environment Scotland has concerns to do with development um, stretching to the to the south. Let's get a slide. Okay, so this was a visualization that was prepared for the development. It was prepared when the application was first submitted. But this is taken from the stones at the Callanish 2 um, scheduled monument site, and it's looking towards um, the proposed new development right in the just centre left of the photograph. And you can just make out the standing stones of Callanish 1 on the horizon, just to the left of that very large standing stone. We thought we should incorporate this bird's eye view uh, because it does help explain the complexity of the design, albeit it's not the most recent. Um, it hasn't been updated for the most recent design and layout. So those of you who've maybe been to the centre before will be familiar with the um, stone slate um, organic shaped building to the rear. Uh, and there's a court. Uh, entrance to the centre at the moment is in the courtyard behind the farm building, uh, the farmhouse. So you can see here the farmhouse is the grey roof with the two uh, storm windows. You can see the gable of the uh, farmhouse and there's a single storey extension uh, to the farmhouse which has a projection with the white gable that you see right at the front. So it's bottom left of the top quadrant. Either side of that single storey extension, there are going to be two new um, buildings to extend the seating area within the cafe, which will be relocated and will be within the front part of the building. To the left, you can see um, the hipped roof uh, area and a uh, flat roofed um, area on top of a kind of uh, deck. That is the new building that's to be added in order to provide uh, a function suite which will have capacity for taking um, you know, visitors from bus tours who are uh, eating, eating at the centre uh, in order to allow the cafe to be able to accommodate uh, other visitors. Up right, you will see there are uh, additional toilets proposed external to the centre. Um, and two of these have been installed under a previous planning permission. There will be a raised, a ramp, ramped access uh, to allow level access to the building, and there will also be some steps. The main changes have come about in relation to the plant room. It was originally intended that it would be uh, below the raised um, area outside the new function suite, but that's no longer possible and hence it is to be located um, where you see the trees in the bottom quadrant, there's a wall running along there. So it'll be south of that, close to the road. And the terracing where there's planting shown, that will no longer form part of the, the scheme. So this is some further photographs. So this is assumed in view from, taken from Callanish 2 looking across the peninsula to the centre and the main. Uh, you can see that there are mature trees there, which provide a fair amount of screening of the centre. The car park's most visible. And then the raised lump 
to the right hand side of the uh, image is the natural um, screening between the centre and the polished one. This just gives like a slightly wider context to that. Again, the centre, just the Mr. Centre on the left hand side, college one on the bridge and some of the kind of wider uh, development within the village. And this image just um, is really to indicate where you see the uh, star there, uh, red star that just is indicating where the next photograph is taken. It's on the shore road in the vicinity of where it's planned that the new plant uh, looking towards the um, boundary wall where the new plant room would be situated and also where you would see a first sight of the new extension for the function suite. So you're on the low road there looking towards the centre um, and you can see just the roof of the centre that was developed um, 25 odd years ago. And if I take you to the next one, it's just zoomed in. You can see these, uh, the trees there that are mature, which it's sought to retain those. And just on this side of the wall, uh, where the trees are, is the location of the proposed um, plant room. Uh, this is the kind of historic wall that runs up towards the farm building. Um, and the mature trees, which it's necessary to protect, they were a key constraint to um, identifying a, a more pedestrian friendly route through the through the car park, because to provide a dedicated path would mean removal of these mature trees or certainly compromising their uh, route routes. Uh, the car park here is the new car park that was created under the Rural Tourism Infrastructure Fund uh, last year, and there will be some additional works carried out to this uh, car park, which is discrete and separate from the main car park in order to provide motorcycle parking. So this is the view of the access egress route, which is existing. So the bus lay, first bus stop or bus lay over bay will be uh, on the right side of the image uh, where buses arriving at the site can wait until the drop off point is clear and there will be two uh, parking bays on the left hand side in, the gra in that grass verge uh, running back to allow buses to wait after they have dropped off. The main part of the parking area, the wall and the trees will be retained as is. Parking here at the moment, there are uh, bus, all, all the bus um, drop off and lay by it at the top, um, set out like an, almost like a finger um, layout. So there will be one main um, bay for drop off, and the disabled parking spaces will also be brought up uh, closer to the building, and the level then will be raised. So there will be a split level between the parking on the left and the parking that and bus drop off to the right. Uh, so again, this is just a shot of the bus parking area, which is to be altered and the two WC units which were recently installed. It's the current frontage of the farmhouse. And as we said, there will be like a new, uh, there will be a raised um, platform to create level access at the finished floor level of that uh, farmhouse. It will be necessary to remove that wall and create like a gabion, a retaining gabion wall structure. And there will be a new building either side of that um, single storey projection that's visible to the left. Um, this is the view of the uh, internal courtyard and that is the current access um, to the centre. The new access will be uh, roughly where the uh, tables are set out there. So in conclusion, it's considered that the development will sit suitably within the rural settlement in terms of visual landscape and settlement character and that it will on balance 
um, the overall impact of the historic environment is acceptable and that impacts can be managed and mitigated through conditions. The car and bus parking and management arrangements initially proposed were not acceptable from a development plan perspective and these required revision. Pedestrian routing through the development is not ideal and was negotiated at length with the agents. However, the finalised proposals are as currently detailed and they're considered to strike a fair balance between the constraints. Uh, the primary considerations were achieving an acceptable level of roads and parking provision and bus uh, drop off parking and layover and the need to protect the historic environment. And it's worked out that the development is intended to provide enhanced tourism facilities to support what is a historic site of national importance, but also of international interest. Uh, there is a suite of conditions which are set out in Appendix 1, and the application is recommended for approval subject to these conditions. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Morag, for a very in-depth and informative uh, report there and the presentation. Uh, are you happy with the, the, that you have enough information to carry on with this uh, uh, recommendation? Uh, anybody got any questions to ask Morag on anything on the report? Ian? Thanks, Chair. Sure. Um, how many parking spaces, apart from the motorcycle, and the buses, how many parking spaces actually are there? And, and is there separate staff parking on top of that? <laughs> um, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Macaulay, I think it is retaining um, the existing number, uh, other than the additional 10 that were added last year, although through a separate application, obviously they're for the, um, the centre. The developers decided not to segregate the staff parking specifically, uh, but they intended just verbally uh, to note that it would largely be in the separate parking area as more convenient for the staff. Um, if you can hark back to the site plan, if you go beyond the main access into the centre, an additional small access and 10 bay car park has been created just beyond that uh, on the low road. So it'll be once everyone's heading into the main centre, it's the next uh, kind of turn off. Um, so it's largely assumed it would be used by staff and that it can also provide some additional motorcycle bays uh, so they don't have to navigate the larger parking area. Yeah, uh, with you. Thank you very much indeed. From the report. 46, 44 spaces are proposed in total, and that includes the 10, which are basically where you see the right on the centre of the uh, drawing there, you can see the additional parking that was created. Now, it is discrete from the main parking area, which does require pedestrians to move along the road in order to connect. But the avenue where the trees and the access to the farmhouse on the wall um, are between the two parking areas. Yeah. Well, I personally believe it's a, an exciting new development uh, that will enhance the experience for, for the the increased number of, of visitors that is envisaged with the with the new with the the new deep water port and the more uh, big cruisers coming in. And uh, I'm delighted also to see the extra provision for toilets, which would be most gratefully accepted by a lot of people. Anybody else have any comments? Anybody online want to say anything? Don't see any hands up. So in that case, the recommendation is at 3.1, and it, it is recommended that the application be approved subject to the conditions set out in Appendix 1 to the report. Are we happy to go over the... Thank you. That's correct. You can call...
Thank you for that, Vice Chair. Now we proceed to a final item on today's agenda, which is item number five. This is an application to erect a 25 metre lattice telecommunications tower hosting antennae at Tom Ruersk, Bow Glass, Isle of Harris. This application has been a subject of a formal objection from Nature Scott, a government agency, and therefore under the terms of the scheme of delegation it is presented to the board for a decision. And can I invite Mrs. Ferguson to speak to this report? Okay, thank you, Chair. So this planning application relates to um, an application to erect a mobile telecommunications mast of 25 metres height in a remote area of elevated moorland within the interior of North Arras. The site is approximately three kilometres due west of Bow Glass, uh, and it is within the South Lewis Harris and North Hughes National Scenic Area. It's also within the Harris and Oig Wild Harris to Oig Hills Wild Land Area, and within a landscape that is classed in terms of character as being prominent hills and mountains. The tower would host three mobile antenna and two dishes. It would also uh, be um, enclosed by a one point meter high uh, post and rail fenced compound. And there would be the usual equipment cabinets um, and cabin containing um, smaller uh, telecoms cabinets, a satellite dish and also two uh, backup generators. So I thought it would be useful for members just to explain a bit about how the application has come about. So the uh, the application is part of a program, um, otherwise known as the Shared Rural Network. It's a te telecommunications program um, where the UK government have been working in partnership with the four UK mobile uh, network operators. So that's EE. O2, 3 and Vodafone to increase mobile connectivity in rural parts of the UK. So this project covers the four nations. Um, and the aim is to provide, uh, on conclusion of the project, 4G coverage to 95% of the UK landmass by the end of 2025. It's a highly ambitious project. The publicly funded element involves new masts being built, to target hard to reach areas that have got no mobile coverage at all. And these are termed total not spots. Uh, UK government basically pay for the infrastructure and masts, and then the uh, mobile network operators would then go on to those mast mobile coverage to customers. So at the outset of this programme, Scotland and Wales, obviously due to the very extensive um, areas that are undeveloped uh, had the lowest uh, land mass coverage of mobile phone. In Scotland, it was estimated to be about 44% of the land mass uh, covered. And um, the program target was for that to rise to 74% over the life of the project. So this particular application site, it's located in a remote area in terms of our um, settlement strategy, uh, which is the key policy of the Outer Hebrides Local Development Plan. Uh, the application site is on a hilltop, Tom Rushk, uh, which is three kilometres west uh, of Bow Glass. So, for those maybe less familiar with Bow Glass, there's our water treatment um, works there, a car park, and it's the starting point for one of the main walks into the North Harris interior. The site itself extends to 0.1 of a hectare, so about 1,000 square metres, and in common with the rest of that area, it's used for low uh, intensity open grazing. The site, clearly, it's in an elevated location within the landscape, and there are uh, other more prominent hills uh, around and beyond the development site. In terms of location, it's within the South Lewis 
Harrison North Youth National Scenic Area. It's also within the Harrison Wig Hills Wildland Area. And as I said previously, the landscape character is prominent hills and mountains. And the site itself is in common with a lot of North Harris, exposed rock and small pockets of waterlogged vegetation and shallow peat. The prominent location that, uh, of the mast would be visible from viewpoints on the main Harris Astronomy Road from Court Path number 10, which I'll take you to a slide on. Uh, and that's like a popular walking route marketed for the ability to see uh, view birds of prey, in particular Golden Eagle. Just wait for the PowerPoint to come back. Okay, so again, for those maybe slightly less familiar, the red dot indicates the general location of the proposed site, and it's broadly on the southern shores of Loch Langavat, close to where the Langavat River uh, heads south from the loch. So it's not terribly uh, obvious from the aerial, but um, you can see on the left hand side of the slide here, that's Loch Seaforth, Ardvurli Castle. It's in the centre left, centre right of the image. And there is a track that leaves, there's a car park you can see just where the cursor is, and there's a track. Uh, at the moment, which heads out uh, and takes you all the way, just passes south of the side, past that we uh, Lochan, and then it heads kind of northwest, further into the Harris Hills. So this um, plan that's just been provided uh, by the within the application. To illustrate the site location, so you would leave the car park at Bow Glass, and the track is already existing. It's just a stone um, pedestrian track. The applicant has advised that they would use that for ATV access, and then just they would require to um, just travel a short distance north of that to deviate from the track to get up to the top of the hill that Tom Rushk, where it's proposed the site would be developed. So again, like this is just like a, a map that just again tries to illustrate where the um, site is in relation to um, some key things. So you can see it's very faint, but you can see the route of the uh, path heading out uh, west and then it moves north northwest of the uh, screen. You can see where the red dot is just above that loch and is where Tom Rushk is and the loch that's to your north there is Loch Langavat, a very um, well known fishing loch and the river, um, the Langavat River um, to the south. So this is uh, a map that shows like so Cold Path 10, so it's one of our key walking routes in the Outer Hebrides mm -hmm. and this is a very um, you know, well, um, walked route uh, because of its birds of prey um, visibility, ability to view uh, birds of prey in their natural environment. So the track heads uh, west from Boaklas. Um, the blue arrow indicates the where the proposed mast would be sighted, crosses over the Langavat River, and then. Um, travels through the glen and you can then come back towards the car park that's at the head of Mjavik um, Nbeum. So just um, at the bottom uh, there. So that is Code Path 10. This is a view taken from the 859 towards looking towards the site. So you can see like it's like within the North Harris Hills and the mast would appear roughly in that view again, just taken from the A859. So just in summary, the proposals for the erection of a 25 metre high lattice mobile telecommunications tower uh, with 
the attendant equipment, including generators. In terms of materials, it's proposed that the ground-based equipment cabinets would be matte and they could be painted for a green and the mast could be painted in a khaki grey colour. And they have provided the relevant uh, ICNRP certificate, which is to do with radiation uh, for mobile phone masts. The submission states that no access road is proposed to the site. Site plan is fairly generic for these mobile phone masts. We've dealt with many, very many of them over the last uh, five to six years. Um, a compound within which the fenced compound within which is sited the lattice mast and all the additional equipment cabins are required at ground level along with a satellite uh, dish. So here you can see that the site would have to be levelled first of all, so there would be like a bit of cut and fill to achieve a level platform for the actual compound. Then the fencing would be 1.8 metres high. Within that, you can see the, uh, equip the large equipment cabinet, quite a large satellite dish, and then the mast itself, which is fairly standard with um, the antenna. So this is, we had asked the, <coughs> the developer to provide us with an indication of what exactly would be the improvement to coverage as a result of this, bearing in mind, you're looking at how, you know, increasing coverage across the whole of the UK. So the blue areas are where there is existing mobile phone coverage. The red in the kind of like bottom centre is the um, most location of this mast. Then if we can take you to the next slide, it shows the limited coverage, additional coverage that would be provided by map. So some of it will overlap existing coverage and the new coverage is largely that area uh, running north south through the centre of the um, image. And if I just go back, you can see that that green area effectively covers largely the Loch Langavad Loch and the, you know, the immediately surrounding moorland. There was a requirement from both Nature Scott and ourselves to provide uh, that they provided visualizations uh, from agreed viewpoints. So the first one is the viewpoint which is taken from Movigadale. Uh, south of the site, that's Loch Langavat in the um, centre of the image there. And you can see where the mast would be on Tom Rusk, indicated by the orange arrow, uh, just beyond that small kind of corridor loch that you can see. This is viewpoint two, and um, this is taken from the actual path. So you can see the kind of standard of the Kind of like just a stone path that runs out into the interior of the North Havis Hills. Um, and again, indicated with the orange arrow, the approximate location of where you would see the mast. In viewpoint three, this is um, taken from the Hebridean footpath. And again, it's looking back this time towards where the site would appear. Um, this one is taken from the far side of the main road and again looking out into the interior of the North Havis Hills and again where the mast would appear. And this is taken on the western shore of Loch Langavat, so you're quite almost like halfway along the loch looking back southwards. So if I maybe it might be useful just to go back to this slide so you can see that this is the where the viewpoints are taken. So that last one is on the western shore of Loch Langavat, so it's the top out of viewpoint five. Viewpoint one was from the top of Movigadale, one of the kind of popular walking hills to the south of Loch Langavat. Viewpoint two is taken on the footpath, and then the other two viewpoints are taken um, near the you know near the main road.
Okay, so the key planning issues here as are that the site is located in a remote area where the spatial strategy of the Outer Hebrides local plan and it is assessed as being contrary to the ski policy of our plan. It's located in an elevated location in the landscape in conjunction with advice from Nature Scott and our own uh, visit to the site. It's concluded that there will be significant landscape and visual impacts, including impacts on the special qualities mm -hmm. of the South Lewis, Harris and North Uist National Scenic Area, and also on the uh, wilderness characters of the Harris to Uig Wildland Area. And it's in receipt of a formal objection from Nature Scott. There's also an objection from the, uh, the North Harris Estate itself in relation to the potential for subsequent consequential development. The development will be highly visible from a number of viewpoints on Lewis and Harris spinal route, as well as from other key view viewpoints within the remote areas illustrated in the previous images. It's likely to result in consequential development that doesn't form part of the current application. So the nature of the proposed development, its scale, the proposed siting is such that the proposed development is not considered to comply with the development plan and in particular the specific specific policies of the Outer Hebrides Local Development Plan and National Planning Framework 4. So it's assessed as being contrary to the key policy, the settlement strategy DS1 for remote areas. It's contrary to policy NB H1 landscape of the development plan. It's contrary to National Planning Framework 4, Policy 4C and 4G, uh, natural places. It's also assessed to be contrary to the Outer Hebrides Local Development Plan, Policy E10 for communications infrastructure and National Planning Policy 24 for digital communications. The full assessment against these policies is set out in the report. If I can just take members to the report itself. So the executive summary is set out like on um, section two of the report. And it's. Right. So another slide here. OK, so before I go to the report, so in conclusion, it's considered that the mass would introduce an alien and imposing structure into an elevated position in what's uh, assessed um, in terms of the special qualities as a virgin and iconic landscape, which is currently absent of any form of development other than a footpath. Um, in terms of telecommunications policy, the proposals have not clearly justified a locational need in the remote area and based on the advice, advice of Nature Scott and our own assessment, there will be clear significant adverse effects on the special qualities of this part of the National Scenic Area and the wilderness quality characteristics of the Uig Harris Hills Wildland Area. Therefore, the case that the principle of development at this location would not be acceptable despite, despite it being identified as a not spotted area without mobile coverage. The proposal would therefore be wholly contrary to policy DS1, the settlement strategy of our local development plan. Further, whether development might provide an element, may provide an element of coverage to a total north spot area, the development benefits are very localised. Um, and the development is not required for reasons of overriding public interest. The predicted coverage of the new mast and the very remote location of the site means that there's very little to justify it on social or economic grounds. And in terms of landscape and visual impacts, the proposal fails to demonstrate sensitive siting design and scale of development, and therefore does not minimise impact on the open and rural character of the um, landscape and its qualities of remoteness. Finally, the advice of Nature Scott, it's unequivocal in that the proposed development would result in significant adverse effects on the area's landscape at attributes, including the special qualities of the National Scenic Area and the wilderness characters 
characteristics of the wildland area and therefore the, the development is assessed not to comply with policy uh, NBH1 landscape or policy 4C and G of natural places under the National Planning Framework 4. In terms of communications and digital infrastructures, while there is strong support for development of telecommunications infrastructure across the UK and Scotland, the benefits that would be provided by this proposed development are not outweighed by the significant landscape and visual amenity, amenity impacts that would arise. There's a clear absence of justification in order to um, in order that it could be justified under the communications infrastructure or digital communications, um, digital infrastructure policies of the Outer Hebrides Local Development Plan or National Planning Framework. And there are no exceptional circumstances or imperative reasons of overriding public interest considered to exist that would outweigh the harm and therefore justify the approval of the development. So if I can then take members to the report, so section two is like an executive summary that sets out um, a summary of the assessment uh, that has been carried out. The recommendation is that the planning permission be refused for the reasons that have been set out in Appendix 1 to the report. Section 5 sets out details of the application, including um, the pre including a note that pre-application advice was provided to the developers uh, by ourselves and by Nature Scott, but did not alter um, the, their approach to submitting uh, the application. Um, the site context and description of the development is set out in section six. Section seven sets out the legislative context, eight, the planning history, Section nine sets out the um, consultation advice we have received from um, Nature Scott, Scottish Water and the Coral Archaeology Service. Section 10 sets out the public participation aspects, including the advert of the application in the press. And policy 11 sets out the detailed, section seven sets out the detailed policy assessment. So sorry, so section 11 sets out the relevant policies, the development plan, and section 12 sets out the assessment. The conclusion is that the development is not in compliance with the development plan and is recommended for refusal based on the reasons in Appendix 1 to your reports. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Morag, for that very good report. Um, can I open this out to members of the board? the Chamber or online for any questions or comments. Firstly, Vice Chair, Councillor McKeever. It's true that if we were to approve this, that it would be called in, seeing that nature is involved. Um, in terms of planning procedure, uh, in this case, the application would be notifiable. And therefore, if the committee were minded to approve the application contrary to our recommendation and to the clear advice of Nature Scott, then it would be necessary for us to submit a notification to the Scottish Government and it would be up to the Government to decide whether or not they would call it in. I'm, I'm not advocating it. Uh, I'm happy to go with the recommendation to refuse. I, I think it's a very little gain for a lot of pain. Uh, the, the, the area that's going to be enhanced isn't all that great, really. The, the signal area that they're projecting. I'm happy to go with a recommendation to refuse. Just a, a question for myself, Mrs. Ferguson. During the process of this application, has the developer's agent sought to mitigate the several planning concerns outlined by the department and Nature Scott during this application? No, they've provided some additional information in terms of the visualizations that you saw there. But that does not that illustrates the harm, but it doesn't actually provide mitigation in itself. Any other questions from members? No. 
Therefore, the recommendation is that planning permission be refused for the reasons set out at Appendix 1 to this report. Do members agree that planning be refused? Agreed. Thank you. And is there for the finding of that item? And can I therefore conclude the meeting by thanking you all for your attendance? Enjoy what is the remainder of your spring, start of the summer, and we'll see you the next time round. Thank you. Thank you.